Hello, and welcome to this teaching on the origin of the Roman Catholic Church. People often ask, when did the Roman Catholic Church begin? Is the Roman Catholic Church the church that was started by Jesus Christ? Are the beliefs and teachings that they have, are they from God? Did the Roman Catholic Church give us the Bible? Were they the authors of it? Are they the ones that put it together? And are they the ones that uh, interpret, interpret it for us today? Is the Roman Catholic Church the church that Jesus Christ established on this earth? And therefore, are we under its authority? Is this the church that we should follow? These questions, I hope and pray that I'm going to be able to answer during this series. The Roman Catholic Church claims that it is the one true church that has been started by Jesus Christ. They base this primarily on the passage found in Matthew 16, verse 18. This is where Jesus was talking with Peter and asked Peter, who did uh, Peter believe that he was? And he said, thou art the Christ the son of the living God. And they believe, we'll look at that verse a little later, but uh, this is where Jesus proclaimed that Peter would be the foundation, he would be the rock that Jesus would build his church upon. And because of that, they claim their authority has been passed down through the centuries, through ap apostolic succession. They believe that the popes, the cardinals, and the bishops, and the priests all function under the authority that was given to Peter by Jesus Christ. And they also believe that the, the scriptures were given to them. And that through the Roman Catholic Church and through the interpretation of the Roman Catholic Church, we will have understanding of what God teaches us through his word. Now, there are two critical points that the Roman Catholic Church must absolutely prove if these things are to be believed. If we are to believe that they are the one true church started by Jesus Christ, uh, that, the, that the Pope functions under the authority of Jesus Christ, that he is the vicar of Christ on earth today, and that they are the one true religion. There are two critical points that they absolutely must prove. One is that Peter indeed was the first pope. That Peter was the rock that Jesus Christ was talking about, that when he said, I will build my church upon this rock. And secondly, <clears throat> if that being true, secondly, they must prove that there is apostolic succession. Both of them are required if either of these teachings are found to be false or cannot be proven through either scripture uh, and or history, then the very foundation of the Roman Catholic Church crumbles. It just falls apart. Everything else that they say, everything else that they claim, everything else that they say is from God, all the authority that they say that they have, it's all gone because it's all built upon a, a false foundation. If Peter was not the rock that Jesus was talking about, uh, or if there is not apostolic succession, then everything that is going on in the church today has no authority whatsoever. It is simply men making up their own teachings and their own doctrines and functioning under their own authority. And also many of the other teachings of the Roman Catholic Church that have come down through the ages would have no more of an impact than any teaching that has come simply through any man, through any woman, down through the ages. Because it would not be under the authority of God. It would simply be under the authority of man himself. So let's start to break this down. Let's look at, those, at these two questions. Number one, the question, is Peter the rock? that Jesus was talking about when he said, I will, thou art, he says, you are Peter, you are, you are Peter, the, the Petra, you are Peter, the Petros, and upon this Petra, I will build my church, one being a stone, one being a rock. Most people are very familiar uh, with this argument of one talking about uh, a stone and one talking about the rock that the church would be built upon. It comes from Matthew 16, verses 15 through 19. He said to them, 
Jesus had said to Peter, who do people say that I am? Who are people saying that I really am? And Peter answered and said, well, some, some people think that you're Moses. Some people think you're Elijah. Some people you're John, think you're John the Baptist that's come back from the dead. And then Jesus looked at Peter and he said, who do you say that I am? Who do you think that I am? And Peter answered and he said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Quite a declaration. And Jesus said to him, Man has not told you these things. Man has not shown these things, but my Father in heaven has shown this unto you. And then he says, you are Petros. And upon this Petra, I will build my church. Now the Catholic Church takes that as that Christ was saying to Peter that you are the rock. And upon Peter, you the rock, I will build my church. Other interpretation, all other interpretations are, is that if you look at the Greek, that Jesus was saying, Peter, you are Petros, a stone. But upon this rock, which is himself, the declaration that Peter had just made, who do you say that I am? You are the Christ, the son of the living God. That that's what Christ was referring to. That Jesus Christ himself the son of the living God, that is the rock that he would build his church upon. There's your two different interpretations. I was going to say definitions, but interpretations. And so primarily from that, the Catholic Church says, well, here's the foundation, and Peter is the, is the rock that the church is built upon, and Peter was the first pope. And therefore, the Roman Catholic Church begins here and goes on down through history. Well, let's look at a few points here. And what I want to do here is I, I want to do a, a highlight or a summary of what I have taught on this before. And all I'm going to do is just hit some points here, about 20 or so points, showing that why it is not logical to believe that Peter was the first pope or that Peter was the rock. I would say to you, though, I have done a series on this. The title of the series is Was Peter the, the First Pope? I go into all of these points in that series in much more detail. So I'm going to list them for you here because we're looking at the origin of the Catholic Church. And I'm trying to show right here where the Catholic Church didn't begin first. That it didn't begin at a certain point in time. It began later on. And then look at how it began there. So that's why I'm touching this here. But again, I'm just going to almost grocery list these points. If you want more scripture and you want more detail, I would refer you to my uh, series on Was Peter the First Pope. So let's look at it right here. Number one, again, a thorough study of the Greek and the other scriptures shows that the rock was not referring to Peter, but to Jesus Christ himself. And we just explained why we believe that was so. Secondly, Peter uses the word Petra. Thou art Petros, and upon this Petra, Jesus Christ, Peter himself uses the word Petra to refer to Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 2, verses 7 and 8. Therefore to you who believe, this is Peter speaking, therefore to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And a stone, lithos, of stumbling, and a rock, Petra, of offense. So he's talking to the Jewish people. He's saying, those of you that wouldn't believe, Christ has become a stumbling block to you. He's the chief cornerstone, but he says he has become a stone, lithos in the Greek, of stumbling. He's a stumbling stone and a rock, Petra, of offense. So Peter clearly sees that Petra refers to Jesus Christ and not to himself, the rock. And he uses a completely different word for stone. Not even the Petros, because Petros was used more for a person's name, referring to a person's name. So you see the difference here. Again, I go into that in much more detail in my series. Uh, number three, number three, Peter never claimed nor taught that he was the Pope. Never claimed it. Never claimed to be Pope. Never, never proclaimed any of the prerogatives of being Pope. Never said that he was and he never taught it. 
He never taught it anywhere in the scriptures or to anyone else. You would certainly think that if he was the first pope, if he was the rock that the church was built upon, he would have made that crystal clear. He would have made that crystal clear in all of his teachings later on so that we would know who the sure foundation is. Number four, Peter refused homage from Cornelius. Remember in the scriptures when he went into the house of Cornelius, he comes in as the apostle Peter, that Cornelius bowed down on his knee before him. Something that is done quite often with the popes today and certainly all down through history. What did Peter say to him? He said, get up. Stand up on your feet. I'm a man just like you. He did not consider himself any higher or any better or to hold some kind of prestigious office where man should bow down before him. Look at what happens in the Roman Catholic Church. And I, I guess to be fair today, it happens a bit less. I mean, there's certainly the bowing uh, and kneeling before the Pope. I believe they still kiss his ring. In times past, they would kiss his ring and kiss his feet. Uh, I think they've kind of eased up on that a little bit with the, with the kissing of the feet. But boy, you go down through history and people were just prostrating themselves uh, before the Pope. In fact, times he would sit in this throne, his big chair, and they would carry him around. You know, like, uh, here it is, the Vicar of Christ. Peter right here saw none of that in his life and took none of that. He said, stand up on your feet. I'm a man. Number five, Peter instructed his fellow apostles not to lord it over the flock. He talks about, again, when you come before them, don't, don't, don't be lording things over. Don't use extra power. Think you have extra power. He, he claimed nothing of superiority before the people. Number six, Peter never mentioned the papacy in any of his writings. Never spoke about it. I mean, you think how if the Catholic Church is true, and it is that the Roman Catholic Church is true, and it's the church that Jesus Christ started, and the whole organization from the Pope and the cardinals and the bishops all the way through, you would think if that's what Jesus Christ established, and Peter was the first one, that he certainly would have made this clear, that he would have spelled it out of how this is supposed to, supposed to work. He never mentions the papacy one time. Doesn't say anything about it. Number seven, Peter attributes some of the privileges of a pope to all believers. Peter and the other apostles, but Peter attributes some. What is the pope? The pope is a holy, royal priest. The scripture says that each and every single true believer in Jesus Christ is a holy, royal priesthood. This whole setting up of classes and orders and this and that and, and this one's holy and has holy orders and has certain powers and certain abilities and certain authorities the scriptures clearly teach that a true believer a true born-again believer in jesus christ god calls them a holy royal priesthood and it says that they offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to god there's no special class of people that one has to go to. The, the apostles, Peter, Paul, all of them, they didn't see themselves as we're special ones that you have to come to so we can take a sacrifice and offer, offer it up to God for you. God says each and every single believer can do this. Again, the scripture and the details, please see my series. I feel like I'm rushing through these things, but I, I just want to touch it again here. I, I back this all up with scripture in my series was Peter the first pope. Number eight, and I think very important, no other writer of scripture refers to the papacy. No other writer of scripture refers to the papacy. Nine, the apostles did not regard Peter as their superior. And we're going to look at some examples down through scripture, but none of the apostles looked at Peter as like he's the head apostle. He's the Pope. He's the one that we have to submit to, and we is the one that we have to listen to. Number 10, Peter did not lead the Council of Jerusalem. There, there's a very strong argument there. Again, please go see my series. But he did not issue the final decision. Someone who was the Pope and has the power of the Pope would certainly be the one that would issue the final decision. Peter did not function that way. Number 11, Peter was often spiritually weak. Peter was often spiritually weak. He was uh, easily influenced by Satan. 
I don't know if I can put the word easy in there, but he was certainly influenced by Satan. Uh, he denied that Christ would go to the cross. He had very little understanding of that. He had to be rebuked by Jesus. Jesus had to speak to him and say, get behind me, Satan, which means he was speaking the words of Satan. I'm not saying he was possessed, but he was certainly being influenced and thinking like Satan. He denied Christ three times when, when Christ was taken and he was getting ready to go to the cross. This just shows a weakness here. Now you say, well, we all have feet of clay. We're all human. We're all, and I understand that. But if you start putting this in the context that here's the, here's the being, here's the man that is the rock that the church is going to be built upon, that he's the first pope, that you are Peter and upon you I will build my church, I think we're kind of expecting a little bit more. We're expecting something a bit stronger here, especially, uh, uh, especially spiritually. <coughs> Excuse me. Again, this is hardly a trait that we would see in someone who is supposed to be the vicar of Christ. Number 12, and I, th and I see this even more important uh, than simply him being weak and uh, easily influenced in the wrong direction. That, that's strong, but, but here's even a stronger one. Paul had to rebuke Peter. Paul had to rebuke Peter for his teaching. Galatians chapter 2. Again, I, I deal with it in detail in my series. But Peter, again, becoming weak, he was intimidated by the Jews. He was intimidated by the hierarchy, the Pharisees of the Jews. And he began to teach the Gentiles that they had to be circumcised. He was putting them back under the law. Peter was mixing law and grace together. That is a serious error. And it was hypocrisy. He would speak one way over to the Gentiles, but then when he got with the Jews, because he became, if I can use the word afraid, he started mixing the, the Judaism and the Christianity together. So he was being hypocritical, and he was teaching law plus grace. And Paul said, this is wrong. And he went into him and he confronted him to his face, the scripture says. This is big. Does someone come along and confront the Pope to his face and say, you are in doctrinal error and you need to stop it and change now? What are you doing? What you're preaching, what you're teaching is against the word of God. You don't see that happen too often. If you look at the structure of the Catholic Church, the Pope is the one who speaks ex cathedra. He's infallible when he speaks about doctrine. Well, Peter's talking about doctrine here. He's talking about how to be saved. Doesn't get too much more important than that. And Paul has to go and rebuke him. You don't go and rebuke, and he did it publicly. You don't go and rebuke the Pope even publicly. Another argument here that, that no one was regarding Peter as a Pope or anyone with superior authority. Number 13, there's no scriptural evidence that Peter was in Rome. Uh, some have argued that he died in Rome, but there's certainly no evidence that he was in Rome starting a church. Uh, and again, I go into that in great detail in my series, uh, that you see Paul was in Rome when Paul was dealing with the church. And there's absolute, absolutely no mention of Peter whatsoever. Number 14, and very important, Peter never taught about papal succession. Even if Peter was the first pope, which I think we're showing he's not, he was not. How does it work from here? What happens after I die? Who's the next pope? How does the, how, how, what's the succession? What's the process? How do you go about these things? You can't take hundreds and hundreds of years to develop a process of how to get the next pope. Who's going to be the pope for those hundreds and hundreds of years that it may take you? Or whatever amount of time that it takes you. He certainly would have certainly would have spelled out that here I am, and now when I go, here's the next one that needs to move on. And, he, and here's what you do in order to select the next probe so that the church can keep right on moving the way it should. He mentions nothing about it. Fifteen, none of the New Testament writers taught about papal succession. Nobody did. Not only Peter didn't, nobody did. Sixteen, the Apostle Paul believed the church was built on Christ. Not on a man. It was built on Jesus Christ. 
17, Paul sees Christ as the rock, not Peter. Again, go to my series. All of the scripture is there. 18, the teaching of the Roman papacy. The papacy, all that it encompasses and all it is itself, is without any biblical or apostolic support. The scriptures just do not teach about it. And much of its teaching, we'll get into some details later, but much of its teaching contradicts the scripture. Not only the scripture doesn't teach to do it, it contradicts the scripture. Number 19, nowhere other than in the Catholic interpretation of Matthew 16, do we have we seen a hint that Peter was the rock that Christ was building its church upon? It's pretty unique to the Roman Catholic Church itself. Augustine, considered one of the greatest church fathers by both Catholics and Protestants, interpreted Matthew 16 as referring not to Peter, but to Christ. Augustine said, Matthew 16 is talking about Christ. Jerome agreed with Augustine. 21, Paul said, no man, not even an apostle, can lay any other foundation than Jesus Christ. No man, not even an apostle, no one can lay any other foundation than Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 3.11 For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now you get into here, sometimes when you talk with the Catholics about this, and you, you get into some word playing here, and you get into some uh, Bible gymnastics, and you get into, you know, the smoke and the mirrors, and the ducking and the weaving, and the bending and the twisting. And they say, well, you know, really, technically, yes, Jesus Christ is the foundation, but he was referring to Peter as the human uh, rock that the church was going to be built upon. So Peter is, I'm using the word Pope, but Peter is the rock that the church was going to be built upon. But ultimately, Jesus Christ is the rock. And Jesus Christ is the foundation. But he's just, my words, like, like a, a stepping stone here. And he's the one here on earth. But ultimately, it's Jesus Christ. Well, they do, do the same thing with Mary. When it comes to Mary being a mediator. The scriptures clearly teach, for there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And the Catholic Church, Roman Catholic Church, clearly, clearly makes Mary a mediator. You're to go to Mary and pray to Mary, and Mary will intercede. And Mary, when you pray to Mary, then Mary will go to Jesus, and then Jesus, your prayers will be answered then if Jesus goes to the Father. Well, and then they say, well, you know, Jesus, we understand Jesus is the mediator, and technically there's only one mediator, but Mary has this role as the mother of God and the mother of Jesus that you can go to her. And see, we start bending, we start twisting, we start moving things. So by the time you're done with it, no, Mary's another mediator then. Mary is a mediator between you and Jesus, and then Jesus mediates between you and God, the Father. That's not scriptural. That's not what the scripture says. We, when we pray, when the Lord said, to, when they said to us, teach us how to pray, what did he say? Our Father. Our Father who art in heaven. He didn't say, go, dear Jesus. And he didn't say, hail Mary, full of grace. He didn't say, and, and this saint, and this one. And this. Our Father who is in heaven, the true child of God, prays directly to God. And his access to God is through Jesus Christ. It is because he is a child of God, a true child of God, it is because he's trusted Christ as a savior. His sins have been cleansed and forgiven through what Jesus Christ has done for him. That gives us access to the Father. So in that sense, we're praying to the Father through our access to the Father is through Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ becomes our mediator. Jesus, So we are going through Christ. But we direct our prayers right to God. We don't have to go to anyone else and ask them to pray for us or to intercede for us. Mediator, intercede. So we get back on target here. Do you see what we're saying? If Peter's the rock, then Jesus isn't the rock. If Jesus is the rock, then Peter isn't the rock. There's no, let's add on one or two or three or four more. 
That's what the Catholic Church has done. Peter DeRosa. Let me just give you a couple of quotes here and then, then we'll close this out. We've actually looked at 21 reasons here now why Peter would not be the Pope and that there is absolutely no mention of apostolic su succession here. Peter DeRosa, let me give you a little background. He attended St. Ignatius College, which is a Jesuit school. He was ordained a Catholic priest in 1956. He studied at the Gregorian University in Rome and at Oxford University. Professor of Metaphysics and Ethics at St. Edmund's College and later Dean of Theology at Corpus Christi in London. He wound up leaving the priesthood in 1970. And after he left the priesthood, he wrote a book entitled Vicars of Christ. And in this, in the, on page 23 there, he writes about concerning Matthew 16, 18, the very thing that we've been talking about here. Listen to what he says. I'm going to quote from him. Why did the Roman Catholic builders disallow Jesus as their rock when their first pope says he is? They make Peter their rock instead of Christ. It's exactly what we're talking about. And he's in essence saying, why did, why did the builders of the Roman Catholic Church disavow Jesus as the rock when Peter says he's the rock? They make Peter their rock instead of Christ. Listen, there is, however, an another, another interpretation of this text with a better pedigree than most Catholics realize. It may jolt them to hear that the great fathers of the church saw no connection between Matthew 16, 18 and the Pope. One after another, they analyzed it. Cyprian, Origen, Cyril, Hillary, Cyril, <laughs> Hillary, Jerome, Ambrose, Augustine. They are not exactly Protestants. Not one of them calls the Bishop of Rome a rock or applies to him specifically the promise of the keys. This is staggering to Catholics as if they were to find no mention in the fathers of the Holy Spirit or the resurrection of the dead. The surprises do not stop there. I'm continuing to quote this former priest. The surprises do not stop there. For the fathers, it is Peter's faith or the Lord in whom Peter has faith, which is called the rock, not Peter. Remember we said back before, who do you say that I am? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. It is that declaration and who Jesus is. That's the rock that Christ is building his church upon, that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Let me go back to quoting. All the councils of the church from Nicaea in the 4th century to Constance in the 15th agree that Christ himself is the only foundation of the church. That is the rock on which the church rests. Last paragraph. Perhaps this is why not one of the fathers speak of a transference of power from Peter to those who succeed him. Not one speaks, as church documents do today, of an inheritance. There is no hint of an abiding Petrine office. End quote. Vickers of Christ, page 23, if you want to go look it up. I believe that all of this together, and again, the details are, are in my series, go and look at them. I believe that all of this together shows that Peter was not the first pope, that the Roman Catholic Church was not established then, that God was not building his church upon Peter as the rock, and that there is no papal succession. If Peter is not the rock, if Peter is not the first pope, there's no popes to there's nothing to succeed. It's not there. And there's no evidence anywhere in scripture or in history of papal succession. There's evidence of popes being appointed, but not coming from the scriptures. The Roman Catholic Church has no biblical foundation to stand on to teach that the Roman Catholic Church was founded upon Peter as the first pope. And without that, the foundation crumbles. It is built upon a false foundation. Their, their claim to being the one true church started by Jesus Christ, it falls. It absolutely falls. There's no truth to it. And again, as we said, there's no apostolic succession. 
their beliefs and their teachings the foundation of the Roman Catholic Church. It is not a church that has been ordained by God. It is a religious system that has been established by man. And we're going to see this as we, can, as we go through the study here. Again, I'm, just, I'm laying a foundation here to show when it was not started. From here on, we're going to talk about when it did start and how it started. But we can see here, if it's not started by God, it's started by man. It's, its religious foundation is no different than any other false religion. It's no different than any other. <clears throat> you have the Mormons. The Mormons were started by Joseph Russell. I'm sorry, by Joseph Smith. I'm getting ahead of myself and thinking of Charles Russell. Uh, it was started by Joseph Smith. And, and how did he do it? Well, here's the Bible, and it's the Word of God, and we believe it. But now, whoop, God has given us another book, uh, the Book of Mormons, the Book of Mormon. And we're to interpret the Bible through the Book of Mormon. So, but it was started by a man. Now, I'm not saying the beliefs of the Roman Catholic Church are the same as the beliefs of the Mormons. I'm saying there's a pattern here in how these false religions start. It's someone, it's man comes along and says, God spoke to me, and they bring their additional revelation. Jehovah's Witnesses with Charles Taze Russell. He comes along and, yes, there's the Bible, and we believe the Bible, and yes, it's the Word of God, but God has now given me some teachings. And now you have all of the Watchtower literature and all of the teachings that come through there. So here's this additional revelation in addition to the Bible. And then when their teachings got so far away from Scripture, well, what did they do? Instead of just answering all the time of why their teachings contradict Scripture, they went out and retranslated the Bible. And they retranslated it according to their beliefs. That's pretty convenient. But this is how man does things. Mary Baker Eddy with Christian science. That's how Christian science started. Here's mankind. Here's a woman that comes and says, yeah, here's the Bible and it's the word of God. And oh, we should listen to it. But you know what? It's not the only thing that we need. And God has given to me another book, Science and Health and Key to the Scriptures. Science and Health and Key to the Scriptures. So you read this book, which tells you how to un interpret the Bible. And here's another false religion that has started. Muslims, Islam, what are they doing? They're following Mohammed. That Muhammad, there's a whole different uh, prophet, and they go from a different book. They believe that the, that the scriptures are, are inspired by a prophet, but they're going to follow the Quran. So on and on you go. Although the beliefs might be different, the premise is the same. And the Roman Catholic Church, we're going to see, starts the same way. It starts from the teachings of man, and then what do they do when it comes down the road, when the, when the teachings of man start to contradict the scripture? Well, now they say, you know what? Two things. One, you don't understand the scriptures, and you can't understand the scriptures. We will interpret the scripture for you. And you're going to see for hundreds of years, that's the way it was. They've lightened up a bit with that today, but the first hundreds of years, it was you can't understand the word of God. We are God's people. We are ordained by God. We are the authority of God. This is the Pope and the cardinals and the bishops and the priests. We will tell you what the word of God says. And then their second attack was, well, let's remember now, we don't get all of our teaching from the Bible. It's not sola scriptura. There's other things have to come along. And so now they added tradition. So the, and the vast majority of the teachings that the Roman Catholic Church has has nothing to do with Scripture. It comes from tradition. And they take the tradition and they put it on the same level as the Scriptures. It's just as holy. It's just as sacred. It's no different than, than Joseph Smith adding his Book of Mormon, Mary Baker Eddy, Science and Anarchy to the Scriptures, the Jehovah's Witnesses. It's no different. Do you see? They start with their own thinking. They move to their own teachings. We're the only ones can understand it. And now we have tradition too. And then the argument comes, well, you know, you have tradition in the Bible. And you can, you know, so tradition's not a bad thing. Any tradition that you have in the Bible that's given in Scripture always agrees with Scripture. Any teaching that comes through tradition, when Paul was talking to Timothy, and what you learned through tradition when you were growing up, it all agreed with the Scripture. There is no tradition that's taught in Scripture, that's brought down from Scripture, that agrees with what the Word of God says. So they're bending and twisting the use of the word tradition. 
So you see the commonality here? I think we've looked at more than enough points here to show that, that again, the Catholic Church was not established by Jesus Christ through Peter and that there is no apostolic succession. So again, if the church was not established there and it was not established by Jesus Christ, when was it established? When did it begin and how did it begin? How did it get its teachings? Where did it get them from? That's what we're going to begin to look at in our next lesson. I really hope and pray that you'll continue on. This is a series. It's probably going to go about eight different uh, lessons, I think, at least at this point. I get talking sometimes, and it goes goes longer. but And, I, and they all tie together. They all, One builds upon the other, upon the other, upon the other. So I hope that you'll uh, just follow all the way through this series. But we're answering a very, very, very important question here. Thank you for watching, and may the Lord bless you.